Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, lively and insightful chats with the people who power the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, you can go to mediapeople.ca or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Views expressed by participants are personal. In the push to persuade audiences to choose your product or service over the competitions, it's easy to forget that advertising is, in itself, both a form of art and expression. This is part of what motivated today's guest, Simon Rojas Cajerto, to pursue a career in advertising's creative side. Simon is the creative director and a partner at Derooted Immersive, a creative technologies company that specializes in producing uniquely memorable and interactive experiences for brands and live events. Simon was born in Santiago, Chile, while the country was under dictatorial rule. His parents were part of the opposition, and it's here he learned the role artists can have at resisting tyranny. At a young age, his family moved to Canada, settling in Toronto. Computers and graphic design software piqued Simone's interest, and he pursued those further, enrolling at the International Academy of Design, where he studied advertising and art direction. Simon Rojas Gajerto sits down to talk about living under the former Chilean dictatorship, the authors and artists who influenced his life and work, his experiences working for both large and boutique creative agencies, his time working in Spain's creative industry, and what it's like to simultaneously be both a partner and a creative director. So Derooted Immersive is a creatives technology company that focus on using a variety of technologies to solve uh, marketing initiatives and live events um, and make really memorable experiences uh, that resonate with people and compel them to share. Uh, my role as creative director is very much focused on the ideation and conceptualization of these activations and installations, uh, and then making sure that they are technically feasible and can be executed uh, within the expectations of what the client has. Simone, I'm looking very much forward to our chat, but let's go back to the beginning. Where are you from? I was born in Santiago, Chile. So what was life like growing up in, in Santiago? Uh, well, it was the middle of a dictatorship, so it was interesting. Um, I lived in a little bit of an isolated scenario, uh, spending a lot of time with my grandmother. But uh, yeah, it was a very intense time. Uh, I was highly aware that things were going on that were sort of beyond my control. And at the age of six, we emigrated to Canada. At that young of an age, you understood that what the perils were like of living under a dictatorship then. So that was very clear to you at a young age. Yeah, absolutely. Both my parents were involved in a grassroots opposition movement against the dictatorship. So it was something that was definitely openly talked about at home and something that was uh, very relevant to us every day. And actually, Chile was just in the news because they elected, what, a 35-year-old president the other day? That's right. That's right. It's a, it's a huge win and uh, gives a lot of hope in the time of darkness for Chile. Uh, to have somebody not only who's the youngest president uh, ever to serve in Chile, but also somebody who was a leader within the student activist movement. So somebody who was on the ground um, and, and is sort of fighting for the people. So he has um, a lot of support. And the other important thing is that the election was very decisive. There was no real contention. Um, and so it, it's great to see this progress and it, it's, Amazing, considering the last two, two and a half years that Chile has been going through with uh, all of the economic and social issues we've been dealing with there. So you said uh, your family emigrated at the age of six. Did you land in Toronto? Yeah, we landed in Toronto. Was there any particular reason the family picked Canada to emigrate to versus, say, maybe another country in South America or maybe the United States? Family ties. Um, we had a relative that was living in Canada. Uh, they were the first Chileans to ever immigrate to Canada. And um, yeah, so it was very much because of family connection. So what were your interests or hobbies growing up? Uh, it's very interesting in things like photography. Music has always been my my number one passion. Uh, things like music, theater and dance uh, have always been a, a huge part of, of, of my life. So the, the arts in general have been a huge inspiration all along the way. Did any of that come down from your parents? Because you mentioned they were part of the resistance in Chile during the dictatorship. And you can kind of, I mean, if you look at history, for example, art and artists in general have always been very big factors in the resistance. Absolutely. Uh, both my parents were highly involved in the arts. My dad 
uh, not only in theater and live music, but also as a muralist. Uh, and muralism was a huge component of the resistance and of sort of getting the message out in the 70s uh, during the dictatorship. So that was huge. And my mom, a performing artist, uh, and both of them a sort of ground in visual arts as well as music. So yeah, definitely a, a huge part of my life uh, and a huge part of the influence. You had emigrated to Canada before the dictatorship fell, correct? Yes, that's correct. Do you remember the day when you found out that the dictatorship fell? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How did you get the news? Come in from your parents? Uh, what happened? Yeah, it was from my parents. It was, you know, pre the time of the internet and things. So uh, it was a little bit delayed, but we were we were sort of on the wire waiting to, to hear information from Chile and from relatives to find out what had happened. So, yeah, once the, the election results had come through, we I think we got a phone call uh, long distance from relatives and we were at home. Tell me about your influences growing up. You mentioned that you were very big into the arts and that came from your parents. But was there anyone particularly that you either looked up to as a role model or you just admired their work? In terms of the arts, uh, Keith Haring has always been uh, an underlying theme. I, I love his simplicity, his approach. Um, Would you say both. he's one of the original gangsters or the OGs? I can't believe I said that. Of graffiti, <laughs> of, no, but like of graffiti art, bringing it to the forefront and making it a little bit more impactful and mainstream. Because there's sometimes that negative connotation with graffiti where it people kind of treat it like vandalism. But I'll be honest with you, I did a lot of reading on on this before we we went to it so i was really intrigued by him because it kind of seemed like he was banksy before banksy absolutely like you nailed it on the head um he was really connected to the street culture in new york um everything that was going on the collaborations that he was doing with people there uh, couldn't have been more poignant um and he himself you know what you're saying about it being considered uh, vandalism he himself was arrested uh for for doing graffiti in the New York subway system. Um, and, and so there's you know some pretty famous mugshots of him. But yeah, in terms of, it's more in terms of his approach, I think the simplicity, his his use of like line, continuous lines, um, he doesn't over embellish with any kinds of effects or anything. It's, it's, it's all a simple line. And, and I find it's really incredible and important to be able to convey your message in a really simple form. Uh, and I find Keith Haring is sort of, uh, an amazing example of that, an artist who's be able who's able to convey um, some really hard um, social issues, you know, everything that he dealt with in terms of being um, gay in, in a time when that wasn't accepted very much uh, and, and everything that he dealt with. And so I think it's really important to look at what he was able to achieve with his simple approach to art. There's no real complexity in the way that it's executed or anything like that. And so that's what I really love about it. It's very grassroots and, you know, very much to the point of what Virgil would do with his art is to say, you know, the instructions are baked in how I do it so that anybody else can do it too. What about authors? Pablo Neruda, I'm sorry if I said the name wrong, and Charles Bukowski? Yeah, Pablo Neruda, um, a very famous Chilean poet. Uh, sort of grew up with it and and hearing that all the time. And so poetry was a huge part of my life. Um, but as I became a young adult, uh, I really gravitated towards Charles Bukowski, an uh, American writer. Something about his writing style and his um, sort of dismissing of most of the rules within English grammar. Uh, he, he, the way he he writes is very much his train of thought. And so it's not dictated by... Uh, grammatical rules and where there should be punctuation and when not to use punctuation, but rather it flows in the way that he intends for you to read it, which is the way that he's expressing it. Kind of like a good playwright then, because that's the way playwrights, depending on the character you're writing for, sometimes you have to throw grammar to the wind because that person isn't that refined in the way they speak or you have to get inside their head. Absolutely. And, you know, you look at some of his short stories or one book called Pulp. Um, it's that he paints such vivid pictures of this world. Um, and, and it's through that it's you, you. You feel you're a part of the conversation as opposed to sort of being narrated to. Interesting thing about Pablo Neruda, and I hope I found the right Pablo when I was doing my homework. Wasn't he also <laughs> wasn't he also a Chilean senator? I believe he yeah, I believe he did serve a Senate in Senate for a bit as well. Yeah. So that's interesting because you've got 
basically he's fighting tyranny with his words, but at the same time he's sitting in the Senate. So he's kind of like fighting the good fight from within the lines then. For sure. And you look at when the dictatorship came, you know, it was the writers and, and the artists who who were the first that they went after, you know, people like Neruda, people like Victor Jara. Uh, these are the people that they attacked first because they were speaking what what the the rest of the country was really feeling and saying. So let's bring it forward a bit. What was your very first job? Very first job was in retail, working at an outdoor sports clothing shop in a mall. Nothing just like ev- just like everyone else is a teenager, just doing part time work at a mall. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself working part time in retail? Because I find that there are certain traits about retail, and, and the big one I throw out there is patience. Like you learn to really be, you learn whether or not you've got the patience, or you need to learn to be patient just from dealing with people in retail. Yeah, for sure. I think the number one thing that I that I sort of took away from it was observation um, and observing what drove people's consumer decisions what drove somebody to purchase one coat versus another coat and things like that uh, and really sort of observing what were the characteristics that they were looking for what were the sort of things that made them lean one way or another uh, and that was sort of the beginning of my interest in advertising and, and sort of the whole system of that so persuasion overall if we had to kind of give an, an overarching term for sure so after high school, you went to the International Academy of Art and Design, and you studied advertising and art direction. Why did you pick that school, and why specifically advertising and art direction? Specifically that school, um, I knew of it. I had some friends who were going there as well, uh, so it, it, it seemed good. It was also in an area that I wanted to be in, in terms of the city, uh, and where a bit of my social life was as well, so that, that led to it a bit. Uh, and then in terms of the programs that were out there, it was one of the programs, if not the only one, that was really hands-on where all of the instructors and professors had to be in the industry. And so they were working at ad agencies, making commercials. And so you had a real hand experience with that. So that's why I chose that school. Advertising in art direction, um, th- this choice came at a time when I was I've always been very sort of politically vocal or and sometimes active. I came at a time that I really wanted to understand the mechanisms of propaganda, the mechanisms of mass advertising, mass persuasion, uh, and and sort of what was being used to to sort of reprogram our sense of needs and desires. And it was really graphic design what you fell into more than anything else. Like if you had to kind of pick a specific discipline within the medium. Yeah, I definitely fell into graphic design. What I found is that in the world of advertising, as an art director, I was very quickly getting pigeonholed into three ad campaigns, radio spots, and sort of that traditional media. Uh, uh, Graphic design seemed to give me a title and a skill set that I could do anything, where one day I was working on a three ad campaign, the next week I was working on a corporate identity package for a company uh, or a variety of different things. And so it allowed me to really dabble in the entire industry um, while really relying on my technical skills, uh, particularly in software, things like Photoshop and the, the creator, the Adobe Creative Suite, and leveraging those things to really sort of pick and choose what I wanted to do. What do you what do you turn to for inspiration? Because I've dabbled in the creative side of the media business as well. Definitely not on the level that you have, but I've found that sometimes you subconsciously might even be recycling the same idea, like putting a different coat of paint on it. So what do you do to re-energize those creative bursts? To be completely honest, lately what I've been doing is getting away from any kind of stimuli. I'm really going to the forest, (laughs) uh, disconnecting in the truest sense and not getting bombarded with a bunch of different stimuli of different things that other people are doing. Uh, You know, one of the sort of dark sides of the internet and the creative world is that I find the process of gathering inspiration and getting to sort of that golden idea is a lot more reliant on visual references of things that have actually happened online that you can see other people have done and so people are relying on what's already there and inevitably what happens is that you do end up recycling concepts and ideas and executions whether yours or somebody else's whether and whether you tweak them or not but i think if you disconnect yourself from all of the stimuli and really just focus on concept 
um, and ideation and really the experience that you want people to have with whatever it is that you're putting out there, um, you're able to do that in, in sort of an area where you're not getting bounced back other forms of stimuli that are sort of the same of what you're trying to produce. What was your first gig after graduation? After graduation, immediately I was hired by the school, by the academy, to do some computer workshops. Um, again, I was quite adept with software and the Adobe Creative Suite. And then after that, I was hired by a small graphic design firm uh, in downtown Toronto, where I did a lot of work on books and magazines and publications and things of that sort, and corporate branding. You also spent some time in Spain, correct me if I'm wrong. That's right. I lived in Spain for a couple of years. So what brought you to Spain and what were you doing there? Uh, love. <laughs> love brought me to oh, Spain. Okay. <laughs> uh, I chased my my now wife to Spain, um, and also you, you know to be quite honest, I was a little bit uh, tapped out with my life in Toronto, and I was seeking an escape. Um, Spain was this really unique experience. One because of the language; it's Spanish is my mother tongue, and so I was able to integrate quite quickly into the industry there. And also because of my North American training in advertising, I had a unique approach to, to the industry, which um, allowed me a, sort of a unique offering for agencies there. And I was picked up pretty quickly um, and worked for three different agencies while there. So what's working in Spain like, or I mean, doing the job that you do now in art direction or anything within that umbrella, what's, what's the difference between doing it in Spain versus doing it in Toronto? At the time, the main difference that I had was people really valued what I was bringing to the table creatively, and so they stepped aside. I found later that when I came to Canada, I almost always had somebody over my shoulder um, nitpicking and changing things and, you know, making me create 50 iterations of color because they didn't really know what color they wanted to begin with. Um, where when I was working in Spain, um, there was a lot more creative freedom. People really liked my style. It was fresh at the time um, for, for the work that I was doing in terms of my illustrative style. Um, I did a lot of vector artwork uh, and graphic design of that nature. So yeah, it, it, was, it was an amazing experience, but it was distinctly different in that at the time in Spain, I was really given creative freedom as an art director versus when I came back to Canada, um, I was very much more, you know, to put it in this term, a bit of a, of a Mac junkie, um, you know, a, create, a, a person behind a Macintosh who was just sort of doing what they were being told. So if I had to sum up Spain, there's a lot more independence and trust. There was. I don't know what it's like now. I'm sure it's changed, but. So when you come back to Canada, is there a bit of kind of reverse culture shock, I could say? Because I don't want to use the term culture shock because you had lived here majority of your life you were educated here but after spending a couple of years away in spain and working at a number of different agencies when you came back was it just a real readjustment period for you yeah it's, it's funny you ask that it, there was it was it was difficult because um life in spain or at least in the city that i lived in was very slow um, what, what, what city was that so i lived in huelva which is a tiny tiny town in spain close to the Portuguese border in the coast, the Mediterranean coast. Okay, so it's um, on the west side. Yeah, yeah, on the west side, about an hour or so from the coast, from the border with Portugal. So it was a small town, it was an up and coming town. Um, it was where my wife had gotten a job, and so I just went there and seeked work. I'm sure it's different, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think the, the main cultural shock was the, the, the pace. You know, here, everything was way faster. Everybody's just like, go, 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 go. Um, and sort of what I sort of boil it down to is here you live to work. And there, for the first time, I experienced working to live. Yes, I've heard that before. So, you know, we, we would go away every weekend to a different part of Europe because it was incredibly cheap uh, and affordable to travel within Europe. Um, we would get lots of time off. Spain has, of all of the countries in the EU, I think it's one of the top ones for uh, civic holidays and religious holidays. It's a very religious country. So, you know, in the summer in the town where we were, because it was co close to the coast, 
as well, you know, every Friday, nobody worked in the summer. So you would put in, it was about a, an extra hour every day during the week. And then on Friday, you got off. So every day was a long weekend during oh, the summer. <laughs> and then there's siesta to boot, right? I lived in Spain during a time when Spain refused to adopt the European Union model of siesta, which was about a half an hour. And we still had like two, a half, two and a half hours of siesta. And you guys still made your deadlines. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100% because I was relaxed. I was fully relaxed and I sort of felt in balance with with my life. I didn't feel I, I didn't feel like I was getting churned and crunched every day. Oh, I can completely empathize with what you're saying. So but you do come back to Canada, you come back to Toronto and you land at McLaren Momentum and you were the graphic and spatial designer. Tell me a little bit about McLaren Momentum and I know what a graphic designer does, but what about spatial designer? So McLaren McCann Momentum was a division, or I'm not sure if they're still around, a division of uh, McLaren McCann, and they specialized and focused on experiential um, and spatial design for things like auto show. So spatial design is the ideation and then design and development of one of these like expo booths. So when you go to auto show, they have gotcha, a car okay. with all this kind of, you know, nice sort of housing for it and everything. And that's what spatial design is. And so it was a bit of a leap for me because I didn't come from that world. I didn't work in the 3D realm. All my design skills were 2D uh, and motion based. So going into 3D was a bit of a leap. Um, I, I had the advantage that I grew up with a, an older brother who's an architect and so I was exposed to the world of 3D, uh, especially in the world of software. And he sort of gave me some pointers and pointed me in the right direction in terms of software and, and best practices and how to sort of onboard myself quickly and relatively quickly learn to use software like Google SketchUp and AutoCAD to start being able to convey my ideas in a three-dimensional way that I could then hand over to a fabricator and say, hey, I need you to build this booth for me. So would you say that this is the first time you were actually building something that would come to life physically in a way that, say, maybe a full page insertion or a spread in a magazine could not? Absolutely. You know, with graphic design, I had dabbled in things like promo and shelf talkers and things that do have three dimensional elements, but definitely nothing that was structural. Uh, or that sort of lived within an indoor realm where people were coming in and spending prolonged amounts of time and interacting with the space. So what brought you to B Street Communications? And was this your first time making the jump to art director? So uh, it was not the first time I had made the jump to art director. When I lived in Spain and worked there, I had also done some roles as an art director. But in McLaren, because of how things were structured, um, I felt myself limited creatively. Uh, there was a lot of uh, bureaucracy and lots of layers, as is often the case in big, big agencies. So I wanted to go to a smaller agency, but something that was still aggressive, that they were putting out good creative work um, and something, again, that was local within my city. So uh, I interviewed at a bunch of different agencies and felt that I really hit it off with the creative directors at B Streets and so decided to dive in there. When you're the art director, do you become more of a coach and less of a player? Like how still hands on are you in putting together the end product? At an agency the size of B Streets, it was still very hands on. Uh, there was definitely the wearing of multiple hats. We did have a graphic team that was there. They were, uh, you know, graphic design artists who were there to sort of execute the final thing. But, uh, you know, with all small agencies, you, you do have to wear some hats sometimes. So there was times I was doing photo retouching when somebody else should have been doing it. But I think it was the first time that I, I had a team under my wing uh, where, yeah, I had to sort of guide them and coach them and, and, you know, manage their time, make sure they were meeting their deadlines and fulfilling expectations. And you're hiring people as well. So you're also wearing, a, wearing an HR hat as well, I imagine. Yeah, there was a little bit of that in that agency. The creative director and the partner took the majority of that role, but there definitely was some some of that in my role. So what brought you to Deruded Immersive, where you are now? So it was around the time when 
there is all the economic problems uh, in the states and then, you know, because of being the rest of the world where agencies were being hit really hard. Uh, you know, I was talking to my colleagues at McLaren and almost every creative person was being let go. Uh, and teams were sort of skeleton teams of creative people, but primarily salespeople. And what we sort of realized was that there was this opportunity to be small uh, as an agency, be aggressive because we didn't have to meet um, big agency quotas or mandates from partners and things like that. So my best friend and now business partner, Amir, and I decided that it was a, it was a good time to sort of venture out on our own. You know, we, I, I had personally had a great deal of success with my creative approach to things and Amir had in his career as well. So we thought it would be a great opportunity to bring these two together and, and put it out there and see what we could do. Let's talk a little bit about the hats you wear at Derooted. You're the creative director, but you're also a partner. Does being the creative director differ when you're also a partner? Yeah, 100%. You know, uh, the creative director, at least most of the time, should really be focused on ideation, on the product that's being put out, how it's going to be, how it's going to come to light, you know, what is the end goal and how we're going to achieve that technically and things like that. As a partner, you're focused on operations and finances, you know, and getting calls from the tax man and dealing with the bank when they make mistakes and things like that. So it's not always a creative role. It's definitely not something I was ever trained in or ever thought I would really fall into in terms of the business side of things. Um, it's creative in its own way, but it's, it's definitely a completely different hat with a different fit. Simone, this has been fantastic. I'm really enjoying our chat. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? I am. Go for it. All right. The campaign you are most proud of. I think what we did for Disney and Pirates of the Caribbean uh, was probably one of my favorite activations. I think the the limitations and the hurdles that we were going through in terms of time, permitting and everything, it was just sort of like everything worked out so perfectly well. Everything could have gone wrong with one slight change in any variable. But it, it, my our entire team really, you know, sparkled on this one and, and showed what we're capable of doing. Um, even as a small, nimble team, we can produce world caliber stuff. And you know, Disney definitely echoed that when they when they put it out to the to the world. They got about two million hits in the first couple of uh, couple of days, and they came back to us and told us, you know, how happy they were with the success of the campaign. Your favorite movie. Blade Runner original. Ridley Scott all the way. Yeah, 100%. That to me, honestly, that movie was my original vision for advertising uh, when I was young. I, that's what I thought advertising was all about was gigantic screens on facades of buildings, um, you know, images popping out and sort of almost holographically being presented in the sky. Uh, and it's incredible how realistically I've been able to follow that in my career and make some of those exact things come to life in, in, in the span of my career. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, modern cities, you can't see them now without the LED lights wrapped around the buildings. And like you said, the 3D, I don't think it's really 3D anymore, but I've been seeing some screens. I think it's primarily in China. People will throw them up on LinkedIn where it seems like it's wrapped around the building and it looks like the subway is coming into the station and then going right through you or whatever. It is yeah, pretty amazing how close it is. Forced, okay, so that's what the technical term is, forced perspective. Yeah, forced perspective. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. That's something we're getting a lot of requests for, and it's something where it, it's funny to try and educate people in the fact that it's not, you know, like we've had clients asking us what kind of screen they need in order to achieve this, and we're telling them it's it's not about the screen. It's it's about the content and you know, the fact that, you know, when you look at all these YouTube videos, they're taken from one vantage point. The second that camera moves to another corner, it doesn't look 3D. It doesn't look as good, right? And so it's that thing. People people buy what they see, you know, off of a headline and they see it off of a post on Instagram or whatever it might be. It looks three-dimensional on that post. And so they believe that it's holographic technology or whatever it might be. Your favorite video game? I don't really play video games, but uh, the one that I did enjoy and I kind of continue using sort of as a, a philosophy of life, especially when it comes to packing for travel, is Tetris. If Hollywood were to make a movie based on your life story, who would you want to play you? Nobody.
<laughs> it would be POV. It would be from point of perspective from myself. Kind of like Howard Stern's Private Parts. I haven't seen it. He plays himself. It's it's basically uh, it's an Ivan Reitman film. You check it out, and it's his okay. life story, and he plays himself. And even at the beginning, he kind of breaks spoiler alert breaks the fourth wall a little bit when he's in college. And he's playing uh-huh. himself and he's like, use your imagination, <laughs> because I think at that point he's I think when the movie came out, he was in his late mid to late 40s. And he's basically right. playing a 21 year old version of himself. Uh. <laughs> yes. OK, so to follow up to that, if Hollywood were to make a movie based on your life story, what would you call it? I am a sponge. Any particular reason for that title? Yeah, I honestly believe that I am a sponge. Um, I feel that. You know, life is the river and I'm a sponge in the river. And as the water flows through me, I filter and I pick up elements that come downstream. I can't be, you know, naive enough to think that I could actually change the course of the river. And so a sponge does a beautiful thing in that it goes with the flow and it just absorbs and and, and takes everything that it has sort of thrown at it, good and bad. And so that's why I believe I'm a sponge. Your favorite book? Uh, Tales of Ordinary Madness by uh, Charles Bukowski. Your favorite song? Let Me In by R.E.M. The best advice you have ever received? <laughs> Don't ask for permission. Ask for forgiveness. I'm on the sales side, and I hear that quite a bit. <laughs> it usually follows up with, you sold what? Well, how much did you get at least? <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back in time and give your younger self advice, what would it be? Travel, travel a lot, be a nomad, sort of wander through nature, explore a lot more before other responsibilities come into play. My signature closing question, if you weren't in media, what would you be doing and why? I think I'd be in music. Music has always been my first love. I often have dreams where I'm in an alternate universe and I'm a musician and live my life as a musician. So yeah, I I think That music has always been super important to me, and to date, it's still the number one thing that allows me to transcend this reality, um, to escape, and to to go to another place. Simone, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. That's it for today's show. For more episodes, you can go to mediapeople.ca or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at VicGenova.